Good evening. My name is Mark Baldessari. I'm the president and CEO of the Public Policy Institute of California. And I want to thank you for joining us. Uh, welcome to PPIC and the Bechtel Conference Center. This week, the Global Climate Action Summit is happening here in San Francisco. So I want to step back for a moment and think about how Californians feel about staying, uh, the, their state playing a prominent role in the global warming policy arena. In the July PPIC survey, 78% of California adults told us that California's climate change leadership around the world is either very important or somewhat important. Majorities across demographic groups and regions of the state say this is important. These views are aligned with Californians' willingness for the state to determine its own destiny in this policy arena. In the same survey, 65% of Californians said they favor having the state government make its own policies separate from the federal government to address the issue of global warming. Again, majorities across demographic groups and regions of the state said that they were in favor. So what explains Californians placing such a high priority on climate action today? In the same survey, 67% of California adults said that the effects of global warming have already begun. 82% say that the issue of global warming is either extremely, very, or somewhat personally important to them. What about views on the topic of tonight's event? When asked to name the most important environmental issue facing California today, most residents name water and the drought. We at PPIC are excited to contribute to the discussion on preparing for a changing climate. I would like to introduce uh, to you Celeste Cantu. Celeste is the chair of the PPIC Water Policy Center Advisory Council and a longtime thought partner for PPIC. Celeste is currently the CEO of the Water Education for Latino Leaders, and prior to that, she served as general manager for the Santa Ana Watershed Project Authority. Please join me in welcoming Celeste. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, and good evening. On behalf of the Advisory Council for the PPIC Water Policy Center, I'd like to welcome you. We are co-hosting, as part of the Advisory Council, co-hosting this group, so we're really proud to have you all here, and we are once again at a capacity crowd, so that is always thrilling. So welcome. The PPIC Water Policy Center connects nonpartisan objective research to real world water management problems with the goal of putting California water policy on a sustainable and constructive path. So you may think that's just like lickety split really easy, but it's not exactly that easy, but we're making great progress. As Mark mentioned, this week is Climate Week in San Francisco. So throughout the city, events like this one today are taking place, where they're having the conversation is of how are we going to mitigate and adapt to a global changing climate. The work that the PPIC Water Policy is doing is contributing to that conversation. And it's important work of looking at California's water systems, Reforming the way we use and manage water in California will be at the forefront of how we adapt to climate change. And it will serve well to help inform governments from all over the world as they grapple with their water scarcity. If you're interested in continuing this conversation, there's many opportunities. But one of them, which I'm most excited about, and Debbie Frankel is here, who is our queen bee and mother of the Water Pavilion, will tell you, uh, the Water Pavilion will take place later this week, Thursday and Friday, and we are completely oversubscribed. So unless you're really good at PowerPoint and can volunteer, <laughs> you probably won't be able to get in. However, there is an avenue for you. Uh, the website will be very, very good, and you can check it out, waterpavilion.org, and you'll be able to see the presentations posted and get a flavor of what's going on. Um, I'm particularly really enthusiastic about it. We want to thank the supporters of this research that will be presented and discussed with you tonight. The S.D. Bechtel Jr. Foundation, thank you very much, Lori, and the United States Environmental Protection Agency. Obviously, without that kind of financial support, we wouldn't be able to do this really good work. 
Before we begin, we have some housekeeping. Please silence your phones. This is the right moment and time to do it. So scurry about and do that right away. Um, the PPIC is always looking to improve these events. They're pretty good, but nevertheless, there's always room for improvement, and you will be receiving an email tomorrow with a short survey. Please take a moment to open that email and answer the questions and tell us how we did. Now it's time to get these events started, and I'd like to turn things over to our senior fellow and our center director, Alan Hannick. So good evening, everyone, and welcome. And thank you to Celeste and Mark and all of the rest of the members of the Advisory Council for co-hosting and all of you for being here. Um, I'm going to get right into it. And uh, my job is to, to tell you in, in a very brief way uh, a little bit of the sort of the highlights of this report, Managing Drought in a, in a Changing Climate. You have on your seats a two-pager. We're trying to find ways to be snappy. The report itself is pretty snappy, but it's a little bit longer than that. And we have plenty, <laughs> plenty of copies uh, out, out in, the, in the other room. If, if you like it, what you'll see is that there's, there's a mistake on this slide relative to the cover of the report, because there are actually 30 authors of the report, and there's only me listed there. So um, I, I, it was a, a real pleasure to, to work with this team of experts in a whole different range of fields from all across California and actually one of them is now in Colorado, Daniel Swain. Um, so I'm going to try to do justice to this um, and just want to thank, thank the other authors, including folks, a few folks here in the room, the water team, Jeff Mount, um, and I think Matt CV I saw. So thank you guys, and I, I hope I do you proud here. Um, so what this report is about, it's really kind of a, a culmination of three years of work by all of the folks on this team looking at lessons from the latest drought in California for how we need to get better for future droughts. And what we did was look across different sectors in California, and we have a number of detailed studies on, by sector, and then we got some really great climate scientists to help us think about what is this going to look like going forward in, in, in the future. And, and so this included Paul Ulrich and some colleagues uh, from UC Davis as, and, and from the Lawrence Berkeley Lab, as well as Daniel Swain. And what they did was then help us look out to kind of mid-century, the 2040s to 2050, which is about the planning horizon that we need to think about for a lot of the things that we're going to have to be doing anyway. Any kind of infrastructure investment, typically, or a lot of them take that long, maybe unfortunately. Um, but you know, the planning for the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act will take that long to really get into place. People are looking at planning now, but implementing over time. Uh, urban water management plans typically go out that long. So it's a, a horizon that seems kind of far out, but not really that far out. And it seemed like a good way to kind of help focus people's minds. So, so we're looking out that far, but want to remind you that because a lot of the kinds of changes that we're going to be seeing are really already happening, a lot of the kinds of things that we're recommending to you are going to be very important and very useful as soon as we can do them. Um, and there are some things that can be done in much shorter order than, than, um, than others. So just to give you a little sense of the, wh why the latest drought is really useful as thinking, for thinking about the changing climate, this shows you um, some, on the top is precipitation, statewide averages, uh, and the bottom is temperature, statewide averages since about 1950. Um, the record actually goes back to the, to the late 19th century, but for temperature, this is kind of more accurate. So we're showing you this, this little slice, and what you can see highlighted are the years at the end of the, the 2012 to 2016 drought. Um, it, it ended up, it was, and we get droughts all the time, but this was a particularly bad one. It was the four driest years, it, it, consecutive years on record, going all the way back to the late 19th century, and um, that temperature panel really highlights why it was especially dry was because it was also really hot. We had, at the height of the drought, two of the hottest years ever. Um, you can see 2014 and 2015, and that complicates drought management in some important ways, partly because it just increases evaporation, and so that, you know, plants need more water. Um, at, just at the time when you don't have it, it makes water hotter, um, which also is a problem, and it, and it melts the snow, or you get more rain than snow. Now, 
Those are all things that uh, maybe will not surprise you. Our, our climate experts, and this is based on a lot of the, the research that's been being building up uh, for California over the last 15 years, and, and especially on the, on the precipitation side uh, in the last decade, uh, we're able to, to tell a lot and have a fair amount of confidence about where things are going. And what we're already really experiencing in California uh, are a lot of these things that I'm showing you here. So warming temperatures, they're going to keep getting warmer. This drought that was a record drought in terms of heat is going to be more like a normal drought uh, in, in that planning horizon that I mentioned to you. Um, that is bad from the perspective of higher water temperatures, which creates water quality issues, harder to manage for fish, as well as kind of more evaporation, so it reduces runoff, and um, it, it leads directly into that shrinking snowpack image, which I'm a skier, so that, that, that one, that's, that's an industry that's probably really at the forefront. If water's at the forefront, skiing and snow, snow is really at the forefront in California of getting hit by this, and anybody else who likes the mountains during the winter knows that this was a big part of a feature of this, this latest drought. And it actually was kind of a feature to some extent of, of 2017, even though it was pretty wet because it was so warm. Um, so shrinking snowpack, that's a really big deal for California because we rely on free storage in the snowpack. And all of our systems are designed to rely on having a lot of precip in the winter fall as snow and then melt over time really when we need it in the, in the late spring when irrigation demands ramp up. So that, that's a problem for California's system. Then, now what we're, we're having better research on is what's happening with precipitation itself. And the models are all pretty much converging on California not getting drier on average. Um, that doesn't mean we're not going to be experiencing drier. We are, but it's, you know, if the average per annual precipitation does not look like it's going to be much drier or much wetter, that's different from some parts of the country. So the southwest, the Colorado Basin, is more likely to be, be getting drier, seems already to be getting drier. Here, it's less about that than it is about just changes in the, the seasonality and the, the volatility of the precipitation. So one piece of it is that some, some clouds that are going to be collapsed into shorter seasons, basically. We're going to have what, what the climate folks call greater seasonality, um, changes in seasonality. So winters are going to get tighter, shorter, more intense, less precip in the, in the fall and in the spring, which means drier, right, longer dry periods, and again, changes in runoff that we're going to have more of it in the winter uh, when we're going to have to manage it. And then the more volatile precipitation, this is the idea of looking from year to year at more likelihood of extremes, both wet years and dry years. And this was, this was work by D Daniel Swain and his colleagues where they coined the term precipitation with whiplash, the idea that you can get a lot of this happening from one, you know, after an intense dry, you get an intense wet, which is exactly what we got in this recent experience. Now, that means you have to really be dealing with got to manage that runoff for flood protection. And then we have a, an expert on, a, on the panel who can help us think about how to do that, Tim, later, right? <laughs> um, but have to, have to manage for that, as well as, as manage to, to store the water for when we need it. For the, for the dry years. And then the fifth one is rising seas. And this is uh, you know, something that's been happening for a long, since the last ice age, but it's been accelerating. And in California, we've got a big coastline. Um, we also have uh, you know, a big interior coastline in the delta. And what this is going to do for us from a water supply perspective is uh, it's going to be making it harder to manage salt, both in, in coastal aquifers and then in the delta. We're going to probably need more fresh water to go out of the delta in order to keep the water fresh enough to to use it. So that, another pressure on, on supply. So all of this combined kind of gives us more intense droughts with more variability and a need to man manage runoff in tighter periods um, and in certain years in order to, to be able to both keep people out of harm's way for floods and, and have water available for, for people and for ecosystems during the dry times. So we always like to make reform proposals or policy proposals, PPIC. I think we have to have policy in our, somewhere in our reports. And this one was really about, OK, what does this all mean for where do we go from here? And we tried to keep it short. Um, so uh, we thought, all right, let's, let's just see if we can keep it to, f we tried with three reforms, ended up with four. Um, if you look into the details, it's, there, there are sub-bullets under these four. But the basic idea is, 
simple. This is our, the elevator speech. Plan ahead. Upgrade the water grid. I'm going to show you what that is in a minute. Update water allocation rules, and then find the money. Easy. Um, <laughs> plan, plan that would be great for, you know, I don't know, the next governor, maybe, something like that. Um, so let me just give you a little flavor of, of, the, of these reforms. First, the plan ahead idea. Um, this is the idea that planning actually does matter, and we found this in our detailed reviews across the different sectors. Where there was a good plan, it didn't mean that it went according to plan exactly uh, as the drought unfolded, but folks were a lot better prepared um, than when there was not. And you saw this, especially the urban sector did so much better in this drought than they did in the 87 to 92 drought. because. They got really scared that time. And so they, they put in place much stronger plans with some state encouragement and prodding. Um, and they made a lot of investments in diversification. And um, they, were, they were more or less ready to go. And then they were able to kind of manage that better on the fly by virtue of those investments and that planning. Um, the ag sector, not as, not as great as the urban sector, but you know, had already had a number of things in place, including some water trading arrangements, and, and they, they were able to, to draw on groundwater quite a bit. They are now in the midst of one of the biggest planning um, operations that California has probably seen in water um, with the implementation of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, and we think that that is really going to be key for agriculture. Now, the two areas that really did not do as well, these were uh, rural communities were turned out to be very vulnerable to drinking water shortages, and ecosystems, by in, in most cases, did not have plans. There were not plans for how do you manage a, a bad drought during, uh, for, for, for different ecosystem uh, management problems. And I just want to focus here on the, on the rural communities for a moment. That's what this map is showing you. Um, where we have records of either households reporting water shortages, those are the orange dots. There are over 20, 2,500 households that reported. We're sure there were more, because not everybody reported. But you know, the, the good thing is the state actually did set up a website to find this out. So there was some you know, management on the fly, but very quick response uh, once, once folks realized there was a problem. And then the green dots, those are small water systems, about 150 of them, that applied for emergency drought funding because they were running out of water. Um, what we're recommending is let's not wait till the next drought to have to set up websites like this again. Let's really develop plans for how we're going to deal with this. And, and I think, you know, to some extent, this is, this is underway. There's a lot of attention and interest on this, but we need to kind of make sure that, it, that it's kind of consistently done so that places that we can't connect up, there's a lot of, a lot of that happening, consolidation, places that cannot be connected to larger, safer systems, um, that we have a plan for how we're going to anticipate when the drought is coming so that they're not having to get water out of tanks or water bottles. So reform two, this is the idea of upgrading the water grid. And we're trying to kind of get people to think about the water system as a grid. It's not exactly the same as the energy grid, but there are some ways in which it's kind of a grid. And actually, a lot of other states envy California because we've got a lot of infrastructure that connects our storage to places where people use it. Um, and, and that, what you're seeing here is two pieces of, the, of a three-part grid. You're seeing some of the big surface reservoirs, those are those circles, and then you're seeing lines, which are some of the big conveyance um, can canals and aqueducts, and also a few rivers that, that deliver uh, uh, water to, to various places. Underground, in a lot of that part of the state, uh, many parts of the state are aquifers. California also is very rich in aquifers that are rechargeable. Unlike some states that have aquifers that where the water's really, really far down and it got there with the dinosaurs and it's not very easy to recharge. We have a lot of aquifers that can work in that way. So what we're suggesting is that we got to modernize this grid and think of it more as a grid and integrate it more. And some of this is about managing the infrastructure better, making some investments to fix things that are broken and upgrade where, where we need to. And some of it is about the operations and integration of, uh, of folks, uh, systems that are owned and operated by different folks. Um, this is important at the regional level as well as statewide. This is really important for agriculture. I will say it's important for everybody, but if we don't make it easier to recharge groundwater, it's going to be really hard for places like the, uh, ag in the San Joaquin Valley, ag on the Central Coast, to, to keep going anywhere near what they're doing now, because otherwise the alternative, given their deficits with, with groundwater use, are just to reduce, reduce demand and reduce acreage. 
Okay, number three, updating water allocation rules. Um, here, this is the idea of how do we allocate water, um, how do we allow folks to, to use it, both during drought and during wet times, and we've got kind of a hodgepodge of rules in California. It doesn't work terribly. Um, we're not suggesting blowing it up completely, but we are suggesting some reforms um, in, in to, to make it easier for us to recharge groundwater in wet times, to make it easier to trade and bank water um, so that we can, we can manage this increased variability that I've been talking about. Um, so that's, none of that is revolutionary. That's kind of yeoman's work that can get done. Um, I would say one of the, the areas with kind of a, where we're really suggesting flipping, flipping things around a little bit is on the, the third bullet, which is giving the environment a water budget. And here the idea is instead of relying on minimum in-stream fl in -stream flow rules, moving toward basically converting that to an allocation for the ecosystem in each watershed. Um, we can build upon that as needed, uh, you know, with, with additional contributions of water as needed, but the key idea would be that managers have a seat at the table, ecosystem managers, along with everybody else. They can trade that water, they can store it, they can manage it in creative ways, and get uh, more pop per drop from that water. That would have been really helpful in this drought. And the picture I'm showing you is an example of a prototype where this actually kind of exists. And it's not to suggest to, I know there are a lot of bird folks in the room, that everything is perfect in the refuge system, but it's a lot better than in many parts of our aquatic ecosystems. And the, the refuges now have a water budget, essentially. It's, it goes down when it's dry, just like it goes down for, for farmers, but it's kind of like a senior water right. And and because of that water and coordination among the refuges, uh, private, public, nonprofit, state, um, the, the water birds really did pretty well, um, all things considered, given how dry and hot it was. So then fourth, um, find the money. Um, easy also. Uh, what I'm showing you here is uh, a chart of general obligation bonds uh, in California that are water focused or sometimes com combination of water and parks. And we have gotten a lot of the public conversation about money in, and water is about bonds um, because people, there are campaigns about them, people have to go vote for them and everything. And I don't want to suggest bonds are not helpful, they are, but they are actually a small piece of total spending. Uh, typically, even though even in these last, uh, you know, since the 2000s, we've actually got a lot more bonds in real terms than, than in, in prior decades, but still we're only spending about a billion a year with bonds because it takes a while to, to roll these things out, especially if it's infrastructure projects. And, um, relative to over 30 billion that we're spending on water annually. Most of the money is being spent because of local ratepayers and local taxes. Um, and most of the water grid expenses are actually paid by water users. Um, we think that's going to have to continue by and large and um, that we're going to, we should really be focusing bonds on the fiscal orphans. And, but we, know, we need things besides bonds for that too. And I'll just l uh, lay out for you quickly, the fiscal orphans, these are safe drinking water in poor rural communities, mostly rural, sometimes not rural, but poor communities that cannot afford it. Typically they're small and they just can't, they don't have scale economies and they don't have the, the, the incomes to, to do that. Uh, that's not a huge gap, actually. Um, the big, big gaps in terms of money are floods and stormwater management, both of which are going to, you know, you saw the, the climate um, projections, going to be going to be worse. Um, and then eco ecosystem management is, an, is another one. Um, the orange bond, orange bond that's marked there pending, the one on the November ballot, um, will, would provide a lot of funding for ecosystems, uh, a lot of funding for, for things like groundwater management. Um, Nothing that has passed uh, since the since 2014. There are two that have already passed, plus that one. They don't do much at all for floods or stormwater. It's just to say that that's a that's the sort of biggest concern area. If you look at kind of where bond funding is becoming available relative to where the gaps are, so we're going to have to find some other ways to do this. Um, reasons for optimism: um, the urban sector has been adapting. Agriculture and investing, I should say. Agriculture has been innovating. Uh, we have 
the leading ag sector in, in the nation and, and probably in the world. Uh, we're going to get a chance to hear from one of those farmers um, on the panel, Cannon. Um, and, the, and the ag sector has rolled up its sleeve, sleeves and uh, folks are working on groundwater sustainability. So I think that's really promising. It's not going to be easy, but they are not ignoring it by any means. Um, and I'll say, you know, safe drinking water in rural communities, there's progress there too. And we're going to have a chance to hear from, from Maria Herrera on, on that. There's still work to do, but, but you know, as an example, since, um, since the drought, we've had over 80 consolidations. Uh, and that's a lot of that's with state, state financial support, but also voluntary actions on the part of, of folks in the smaller and the larger utilities that are teaming up. Now, um, I'm not going to want to end on a, on a pessimistic note, but I will say it's not all going to be easy and probably the hardest thing is going to be managing uh, ecosystems differently. Um, we really need a change in course on this. We suggested the water and ecosystem water budget as a piece of that. Planning is going to have to be a piece of that as well and, and just really getting ready for, for managing climate variability in, in, in a more effective way. And what we're suggesting is that that's going to also have to be really a shift toward ecosystem focus rather than kind of the emergency room focus that we've kind of been driven toward um, because so many species have been in decline, um, with, with, uh, especially with our, with our fish in California. So um, I'm, again, going to give you a positive note, which is the lower Yuba River. That's a, a pretty picture. The Yuba Accord just celebrated its 10th anniversary. This is a, a really good example of folks from the watershed, water users, environmentalists, um, together with, with the, the fisheries agencies figuring out a voluntary settlement to manage that water uh, better for, for for the for the fish as well as in ways that are enabling trading. They're kind of using their local grid in a, in a way that's very effective, and they're bringing in money through the water trading uh, to to support their flood protection. They're building setback levees that are going to be good from an ecosystem perspective. So it's it's kind of a a coordinated, integrated approach, and I think there's a lot of potential for for this. Um, you often need a regulatory nudge in order to do this. They did, they did, they went to the table because the state water board told them they were going to have to do something that they didn't want to do, and, and they found a better solution. So that, that's something promising, I think, in, in terms of direction. So now um, I'll leave you with a rainbow. Uh, <laughs> and I invite the panel up. This is going to require leadership. We, we think you know another reason for optimism is that we have great leaders in this state. And you're going to get to hear from uh, f four of them, plus one of the best moderators for this topic that we could possibly imagine. So I'm going to invite Greg and the panel up. And um, I'll just introduce to you very quickly the panelists. So you've got their detailed bios. Um, with you on, on your chair. So thank you. Um, Greg, Greg Dalton is mo moderating this panel, and he's a moderator par excellence. He is the founder of Climate One, been going strong for over 10 years now, um, right? Mm -hmm. And um, really brings together folks from all walks to talk about climate issues, and it's a, it's a treat to be moderated by him and to have him in the room. So come on up, Greg. And then Maria Herrera, who is a manager with uh, Self Help Enterprises and uh, working on the ground on safe drinking water issues. She is also a member of the Water Commission, so she, she just had the fun job of deciding who was going to get bond money for storage projects, so I don't know if... <laughs> <laughs> um, then we, let's see, in alpha order, I'm supposed to bring you up, right? Um, okay, then comes uh, Felicia Marcus, um, who is the chair of the State Water Board. I'm very honored to have you here, Felicia. Um, and Canon Michael, who is the president of Bulls Farming uh, in the Los Banos area and really an ag leader. Is that even, do you have like an ag leader? You use ag leader as your like hash or your... Yeah, <laughs> and, and so it's really it's really true. He really is an ag leader, and he's he also kind of dabbles in in, in leadership on the water side too. Are, are you president of the San Luis Delta Mendota Chair. yep. chairman chairman of the San Luis Delta Mendota Water Authority, and 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 t Tim Ramirez, last but not least, um, is is a board member for the Central Valley Flood Protection Board um, and knows a thing or two about ecosystems as well um, and has a, a day job in San Francisco um, with, the, with the Public Utilities Commission. So welcome and thank you. Thank you.
Well, thank you, Alan. It's great to be here. I've learned a lot about water talking with you over the years and with the support of Lori and her team and Allison and Joya and Wade. Thank you for helping me get educated on water so I could come to a place like this to ask you informed uh, questions about something really important. Water is real to people in a way that other climate things aren't. It really is. Um, so let's get right to it. Um, Tim, uh, upgrading the water grid, uh, do you think that there needs to be more storage and conveyance? <laughs> That's not the phone call we had earlier in the week. <laughs> oh, yes, it is. Oh, yes, it is. We're talking about flooding. I'm going to start with my, um, my state job, so make it a little easier. Um, no, I don't think so. Conveyance, yes, for sure. Um, no storage, just conveyance. Uh, there's no mystery to the fact that the rivers themselves below most of the Central Valley dams, I'm focused mostly on the Central Valley, for obvious reasons, are totally insufficient to deal with the system that we have now and the precipitation that we have now. I noticed on the map uh, on that slide for the grid, I think the Sacramento side was a big wide blue line and the San Joaquin was a little skinny blue line. Was Hal offended by that? I was offended by that. Um, <laughs> The San Joaquin side in particular was plumbed for snowmelt, very predictable, slow runoff, and that's not what happens anymore. Um, we saw that in 97, we've seen it in years since, and long story short, the biggest thing that is in the plan that our board adopted most recently for the Central Valley um, Flood Protection Plan is to really expand conveyance capacity downstream for flood purposes. Floods are good in many regards. They're risky when they affect lives and property, but the ecosystems need floods, the fish need floods, the rivers need floods for lots of reasons. It's really helpful for people and for the environment, and we don't have enough of them right now. I think it's part of the heartbeat of the ecosystem that is barely hanging on. It happens on the Sacramento side more because we use that side for conveyance of the water supply, which is probably why the map had a wider blue side on the Sacramento part. Um, but one of my big things always has been to focus on the San Joaquin and try to think about the capacity and expanding conveyance capacities because I think it helps protect people, it helps protect, uh, protect property, and it's gonna be good for the ecosystems if we can have wider corridors with more habitat and more floodplains. So more conveyance thinking about floods. Cannon, your thought on, you have a slightly different view on that. Uh, I think it's a little bit different, other, but I think it's important to see that map. I was glad that, uh, Ellen, that you have that as part of it. And I'm glad you have the updating the uh, the water grid as, as part of the uh, ideas. I think the reality is is when you see that map looking sort of like a subway map up there of, of the state, uh, it does uh, connect us to the fact that we are all really reliant on conveyance and infrastructure, really infrastructure to be able to have the California that we do have and, you know, right or wrong or, uh, you know, the, whether we made some decisions that maybe at some of the time uh, didn't uh, do the environment any favors, that may be true and we may need to rethink some of that. But ultimately, uh, you know, you don't have, uh, I was actually uh, excited to see uh, or heartened to see the editorial board here in San Francisco recently write uh, a, a, a commentary about how the importance of Hetch Hetchy. Um, you know, again, you don't have the San Francisco that you have without infrastructure. You don't have uh, Sacramento, the city without infrastructure, you know, without protection from flood. You don't have agriculture without, you don't have really any of the things that we have in California without uh, a healthy uh, infrastructure system. I do think with changing climate, we need to think about uh, areas where we could uh, potentially increase uh, storage in some areas uh, that might make some sense. I do think we need to acknowledge that we are managing uh, infrastructure a little bit differently than we have in the past. Uh, you know, Shasta for cold water. Um, I, I think there are just some realities that we, we need to think about. I think conveyance is critical. Um, again, a lot of the things in the report that we looked at and a lot of the ideas, whether it be water marketing or uh, groundwater recharge, all those things are going to rely on a conveyance system that's working. And when I say working, I don't mean just for uh, the, our human counterparts, but it also has to work for the environment. And that's where really the difficulty comes is if we're going to be allocating uh, this water resource, we have to be uh, cognizant of the fact that, uh, you know, California is a highly managed system and all those uses need to be accountable. But uh, I, I think we just need to really take a wide approach. And the other thing is infrastructure takes a long time to build and it's 
it's very dangerous if it isn't upgraded or, or maintained like an Oroville situation. So again, I think the healthy discussion is, is to have, is, the, is understand the importance of infrastructure and then be able to make the investments in a timely, because you know, those slides are very scary with that. Temperatures increasing and, and we are running in a, in, a, in a deficit of getting some of these things done. But I think infrastructure is very important. I don't think it's only storage. Felicia, you tend to be all of the above on these issues. Your take on upgrading the grid and whether there ought to be more one side or the other in terms of storage or conveyance. Uh, all of the above. Um, I, do, I do think it's interesting in the sense that I think we, we need all of it. And we, it, sometimes people use the word storage. It's a code for a big dam or only big groundwater, et cetera. I mean, the way we framed it in the Water Action Plan was, and I wrote the, the line that was, you know, uh, big and small, above and below ground, where we can find it. I, I think sometimes people want to go for the magic, you know, silver bullet or whatever's huge. But the fact is we we need to figure out how to connect a lot of distributed things to find resilience at a local level, but also across the system. I agree completely with Ken, and modern California would not be here if it weren't for an incredible um, uh, multiple sets of infrastructure that would built that, depending on how you look at it, have created a, a miracle of modern society, economics, food, fiber, et cetera, um, uh, with the same caveat that Cannon said about perhaps not thinking as much about the natural environment and what we were doing with it. And, and the course correction is challenging and painful, but the answer isn't to be a tug of war. The answer is to figure out how to maximize every drop. I mean, Ellen calls it pop per drop. You can use whatever way of looking at it, multiple benefits, thinking about uh, infrastructure and figuring out how that molecule of water as it goes down through whatever course can be used over and over again and used for multiple things. So what, what that I would add to the infrastructure conversation, whether you call it smart infrastructure or water grid or whatever, is information. Timely information. We have the technology for remote sensing. We we have there's so many things that we could do by sharing information and having people work collaboratively. I think it's been two decades that Tim's been talking about how to operate without own, one ownership thing. Operate private storage, public storage at other levels so that you could actually maximize the system. It's not going to be the power grid because physics require that it the electrons have to flow and you only have a, a couple of, you know, a few large institutions. But we can do the same thing with water if we're willing to get over the I've got mine or the hallowed talking points. So modernizing our thinking about infrastructure so that it includes things like green infrastructure, but also more transparent information, real time that everybody can see and responsibility for figuring out how to, how to get water you know, out of people out of harm's way of water, but how to get it underground in particular and into off-stream storage. I mean, if you think even in the modern era, you think about, I think about Metropolitan that spent $2 billion on Diamond Valley large off-stream storage and the inland feeder line so that they could put either Colorado River or Delta water in it. Something that would have seemed, even just the idea of mixing those two would have seemed anathema 10 years ago. That's the best $2 billion anybody ever spent because that's why they did as well during this last drought. I mean, many of us went through the drought of the 90s in LA, and uh, this was not the drought of the 90s, primarily because of that, and because people went to town on water conservation and losing the lawn or not having it look like it was in Scotland in the middle of the worst drought in modern history. I mean, a lot of people did some pretty amazing things where information was a key piece of, of that. And the only way to make that virtual grid work is to get a much more modernized information system that we can all use, share it, and then figure out how to get all kinds of agreements that I know we'll have a chance to talk about where people have to actually behave differently and decide that they're gonna see that virtual grid and figure out how to make it work for people and the, e the ecosystem. And you know, people are sick of hearing me talk about the challenge being ecosystem management rather than ecosystem management. But frankly, the only problem we have is between our collective ears in figuring out how to make this something like this work. And yet in water, we're incredibly stubborn on all sides of the issue in sticking to our talking points rather than working on solutions. And I am seeing um, encouraging signs uh, most days, not every day. Oh, Maria, let me ask you, when you hear this, do you hear about uh, the, making the system work? What needs to happen to make the system work for the people that you're most in touch with? Are they part of this system? You know, you hear about upgrading the grid system. 
What, where's the input point to get the people that really need the water the most? Uh, first, I will start, I guess, wearing my commissioner hat. You know, as most of you know, the commission just approved eight projects a couple of months ago, and we're looking at investing nearly $2.7 billion to upgrade, you know, and to bring boost California's storage capacity by 1.3 million acre feet. So that is a significant decision that, and a step forward in ensuring that we increase our capacity so that the water, when the water it does become available, we can store it and use it properly to get us through drought periods. As it relates to communities, I would say one of the things that have been that has been very difficult is for communities to engage in these sort of discussions, is to have their needs recognized when we're making decisions about where to place storage, uh, how the water that gets stored gets used and allocated, and for what benefits. And so um, we've, you know, we have been um, at South Up Enterprises have been really focused on helping communities participate and understand the water planning efforts that are occurring, and trying to work with local um, water managers um, to. Um, identify where to place these, these storage facilities, whether they be recharge basins, um, so that uh, we're developing projects that provide multiple benefits. So benefits for the agricultural industry, as well as providing benefits to the neighboring communities that also rely on groundwater. So looking at, you know, we have in certain areas, uh, soils that are very, um, good for recharge um, and they happen to be located you know near communities that may be experiencing water quality issues or um, that need that additional recharge to maintain ground groundwater levels so that people can have um, source uh, continue to have access to drinking water and so that's something that we are proactively working on trying to identify how we can establish these partnerships and work on these projects together so they can provide multiple benefits and the last thing I guess I would add is, you know, it's once you look at uh, storage and, you know, we talked about putting the, the water in the ground, we also need to make sure that it's protected and that it is, you know, maintained of high quality so that people can, when we, you know, pump it back out of the ground, it's usable for our communities and it's usable for um, agriculture because they too are impacted if the water isn't of good quality. One of the interesting things that uh, was mentioned in the report that hasn't come up so far, uh, Cannon, is merging the Central Valley Project and the State Water Project. What's your thoughts on doing that? Merging the two of them, I think, would be incredibly complex. And it's already, we're having some discussions right now just even about the management of the two systems. And that's incredibly difficult. So I I think it's a, aspirationally, it's nice to think about. I, I, I do see some better collective relationships between the state and the federal project. But uh, ultimately, trying to merge the two, I think, is going to be probably too big of a lift in the short term. But uh, again, I, I see better collaboration and cooperation between the state and the feds. But it, it, it is it is. Difficult and not always helped by uh, administrational changes and things like that. So, pretty bold uh, idea, Felicia, to think about fusing two two water giants like that. Uh, but as a thought exercise, you know, what do you think about that possibility? As not in, not before twenty twenty, let's say. But I don't know. This is probably one of those things I should take the fifth on, um, given my given my role. I, I think doing organizational mergers, having done them, can sometimes be a distraction. Folks have talked about it. I think figuring out how to coordinate and collaborate better would be great right now. It doesn't feel so great, but I'm just reading the papers. But um, uh, I do think that uh, uh, there's, there's an opportunity for synergies that's not being taken, but in any change, it, it's in the eye of the beholder. So there are winners and losers in any coordination that takes place. But I have to say, if you were going to invent a water quote unquote system, it, this, is, you, this is the most complex thing you can imagine, rivaled only by our water rights system. <laughs> so it's um, amazing. You wouldn't have a state agency well and a federal agency does. doing the same thing. Either way, yeah. it's very, yeah. it's, but it, it adds a layer of complexity, but I, I don't think it would be easy to do. I think thinking Thinking about it, though, is an incredibly important exercise to think about what you could do to make it work better for people and the ecosystem and the economy and everything else. Maria, let's talk about allocation rules. You know, how do those need to be changed uh, to, to really address what you say has been a conversation that hasn't been happening as much? Uh, you know, the, the really water access wasn't as much on the radar five or 10 years ago. It's become more front and center after the recent drought. But how, does that, how could that translate into real allocation changes? 
Well, one of the things is right now, you know, the, the surface water rights are fully allocated and we already know where the water is going to go. And so when we look at trying to help communities maybe transition out of utilizing groundwater to surface water, you have to figure out who can provide the surface water, which is a big challenge in itself, especially when surface water supplies are limited. And so we have been having conversations with, again, with local irrigation districts to try to evaluate where, you know, um, it's, it's time now to move away from groundwater because the groundwater is just so contaminated that it's not feasible to treat it. And looking at maybe either um, bringing in surface water or maybe using both supplies. And that has been extremely challenging, um, both just from being able to access the funding to do the proper planning and evaluation. And then even when you know that that is the solution that you need to move forward, it's often very expensive to have communities go from groundwater to surface water because you you know there's treatment involved and as was mentioned earlier these are the communities that are relying you know that have very small economies of scale but are also already paying some of the highest water rates um, and so we we're looking at how do we do that and then also when you're talking about water allocations and bringing in water for to help the agricultural industry, how do you do that in a way that also provides benefits to communities? That's something that we always struggle with. Um, and we, you know, and, and we always say like, if we could utilize the groundwater that's there, it'd be much cheaper if it's, if it's of good quality because you don't have to pay for treatment, but that's not the case. Um, you know, in a lot in other communities that we work with, most of them rely on groundwater and it's groundwater that's, that's experiencing tremendous water quality and water supply challenges. And also, you know, on the Sigma side, we are, are trying to ensure that communities have adequate representation where, you know, local groundwater sustainability agencies will be talking about water locations, water markets. And we're trying to do that while this process is going really fast. And, you know, we have less than 18 months to get these plans done. And we're still working on educating the public and creating seats for disadvantaged communities. Tim, let's get your thoughts on trading and banking and how to, how to improve that, that part of the plan, trading and banking. I was hoping you were asking me the question about Central Valley Project and the State Water Project. Um, <laughs> ah. <laughs> so you, you want to take the, the mantle of the merger? No, I was going to say um, in that category that uh, we talk about this a lot, and I think I mentioned to Felicia this uh, already this evening. It's almost like there's two water systems, right? There's the flood part of it, and then there's the water supply part of it, and the rivers are the same. Right, and people that work on both hardly talk to each other at all. So it's the same environment, it's the same place, but by and large, when we have our board meetings and Felicia has her board meetings and they're right across the street from each other, we get very different people to come and talk about the same places. Hmm. Very few, very rarely do we have the same people come to both of our meetings. They're almost sometimes even the same day. It'd be easy to go back and forth. You're welcome to join ours. I'm sure you're welcome to join Felicia's. Um, but there's a lot of room, I think, for better communication and integration and trading until there's not enough water to trade, right? When there's resources, then I think the system does work better and it has worked better. Uh, but when we get into the fourth year of a drought, there's not a lot to be done sometimes because there isn't much to talk about. Um, if nobody has anything, then it's hard to talk about how we're gonna work together and trade. So if you do it at the end and wait for a crisis, it becomes very challenging. I think if you do it in the front end and have plans in place, then I think you're in better shape to respond more quickly when you start to see things going maybe the other direction. My day job, we often talk about every year we think is a drought. We start that way. We don't assume we're gonna get snow or rain. We assume we're not gonna get any. And then we incrementally learn more about things over the course of time. The information and observation was really important. We live by that. We have to have that data. We have to have that information. It informs everything that we do. And the more that we know, the better able we are to make good decisions. Ken, and this is where it gets to your point about you can't trade what you can't convey, so you need to put in conveyance in order to enable trading. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, if you don't have the transmission system to deliver the product, you can't, really, you can't really have a functioning water market. So I think we've got a lot of interest in the northern part of the state. Historically, there's been a lot of interest to move water to southern areas where there's uh, more demand. And, and again, we've seen uh, through the more recent years, uh, you had some drought impacts, but then you've also had a regulatory, uh, some regulatory changes since uh, the biological opinions. And, and we've seen uh, you know, opportunities where there are spikes in outflow that uh, then you can't catch 
capture to move because you're uh, trying to preserve species, which I know, again, is, is, is a laudable goal, but sometimes uh, the species maybe isn't even at the location of the, of the pump, so better data, you know, maybe could, could show us, uh, you know, I know they're trying to do some more uh, monitoring of exactly where uh, some of those species are, and so that we can, again, it's, it's the idea of being able to manage this system uh, and make sure that you capture the opportunities that you do have. But uh, again, you, you can't have uh, a functioning market if you don't have the ability to convey the product, and that's, that's pretty simple. And can, uh, stay with, with Canon. Do you support a uh, water budget for the environment? Yeah, as, as you know, again, it, this sounds, it, when you talk about the environment, because we are so highly managed, I mean, there really, there are percentages of water going to the environment. So if you look at the, there was a PPIC report actually that showing that breakdown on average of 50% of going to the environment and 40% to agriculture and the rest going to, to the urban sector. And so, I mean, you do... You do have this idea that there are uh, amounts of water going to the environment that are pretty prescribed. I think we could uh, find ways to to have an environmental budget that could be managed. But again, that sounds counterintuitive because obviously, you know, people want to just think environment water runs in the rivers and that's kind of the way it is. But in California, that's kind of not how things exactly work. And so I think, it, you know, the environment can have a water budget. I just think you want to make sure, like we talk about for agriculture, we want to be doing the most we can with our water. We want to get water to the communities. We also want to make sure that the water that going to the environment is getting the, the best absolute possible return. And to me, climate change is exposing the need for more holistic solutions to environmental problems, more you know, it's a complex environment that we're dealing with. I was up in the Delta with the Department of Interior and a lot of the FIS agencies a couple of weeks ago touring, and you just see that that interplay of how, how complex and how changed that Delta system has been. We've got to be looking at really holistic. Water is a huge key, and I never would say that flow is not important, but there's this magnitude of things when you're sitting there at the confluence in the Sa Sacramento River and the San Joaquin, and you're looking at the you know big landscape around you of urban and, and all the other things things that are there and the changes and the channels. And I mean, you really do have to think that there's a lot that we need to do to make the whole system function better. So the environment absolutely needs water, uh, dedicated water. But again, it has to be accountable to the idea that that, that water is going to be going to the, serve that higher purpose and that then we do allocate that, that it is getting the best return because that water also is wanting to be in other places as well. So we just have to manage that resource pretty carefully. Felicia, when he, when Tim, when Cannon started, you shook your head. Yeah, <laughs> we both saw it. So what, what was, what went through your mind? Well, it's just a pox on all the pies. That's all I, I have to say. I mean, I, and and I, I love Cannon um, dearly. I think we're incredibly fortunate to have him as a water leader in this state because he he is one of those people who tries to bridge some of the divides, but the pie that got made that said 50% goes to the environment gets used to say that's like environmental regulation, when it's two thirds of it is the wild and scenic rivers that Ronald Reagan put off the, off the deck for the projects or for storm flows that you really could never capture. And a third of that, so, so that's two thirds of that, and of the third, two thirds of the environmental regulation is for salinity control in the Delta, which is what the latest PPIC paper showed, and a small sliver is actually environmental regulation, and part of why the, the ecosystem's done as poorly as it has is because we've shortchanged it in terms of flow, at least within the Delta, and so, but not to minimize how hard it is to claw it back, because I'm living right in the, in the middle of that. I ag agree completely that we need to figure out how to be more thoughtful for all the uses with water. There's nobody who um, feels that as strongly as I do, but I do think we have a public trust doctrine in the state that makes our, our water rights system, which has some real problems um, to it compared to other states, ahead of most states, and that the environment as a public trust has a seat at the table. But trying to do it is so incredibly difficult and hard fought for every drop for a fish that it's been difficult to get enough so that we haven't diverted more out of the ecosystem than any ecosystem anywhere has ever survived. So I, I react a little bit to the amount and the sense that now the environment needs to be um, uh, uh, penny pinching on everything and you can show each drop 
is going to do X for, or generate this many fish. It's, it's not possible. On the other hand, we could manage it all more intelligently, which is what we actually are trying to do with our water quality control plan, though it doesn't make the headlines, where we propose sharing the rivers between the ecosystem and human uses in, in good times and in bad. But since 2012, we've put out an olive branch, or there's probably a better metaphor to use, to say, but if you can come together on a tributary or group of tributaries to say you can manage this block of water better and more efficiently for environmental and human uses, great, that's what we want. And especially if you're going to throw in habitat restoration and all of that, we'll even cut you a discount on the flows. Because we know fish need... They need flows to be sure, but they also need food and places to hide from predators, and they need that ecosystem restoration that we can't order somebody to do in a regulation. It's actually a pretty evolved construct for a regulation, and it's based on ecosystem values going up the trib, but that's been lost in the talking points on it that um, even people um, who uh, are very sincere a fall for from time to time, but that's why I always talk about ecosystem management, which is there is a way to make this work, but it requires people coming together across um, barriers that are more intense in the water world than in any other world I've ever been in, and I've been in a lot of them. And so I think there's a tremendous opportunity for us to do ecosystem restoration, more intelligent, multiple benefit um, management of water, the floodplain work that's been getting traction in the airwaves and the upper watershed work is awesome. That's the kind of work we need to be doing. But it only happens when people come together and use real data and answers and say, we're going to try something um, together. And that's very difficult to do in this political climate. But that's, we're not going to make it unless we do that. I have a set of uh, yes or no, true or false questions for our, uh, our guests. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is, Felicia loves the lightning round. Uh, this is where they, they squirm just a little bit in there. In there. Uh, so true or false, Tim Ramirez, the legislature should clarify the state water board's rights authority over all surface water and any groundwater that is connected to surface water. I thought they did that already. Um, yeah. Um, Cannon Bowles, uh, the, the same, same question. They, they should clarify the, the water rights authority over surface and groundwater. And it's only true or false, we can only say. True, <laughs> yes or no. Catch me. Uh, yeah, I know, how did you get away from that? <laughs> uh, I think it's already had false, I'll say. Uh, also for Cannon, the State Water Board, uh, yes or no, the State Water Board doesn't have a great track record exercising its existing authority over water rights. Uh, true. Uh, Felicia Marcus, yes or no? You knew he would say that. <laughs> True. Uh, Cannon Bowl's release of water from its dams is one area where San Francisco is too conservative. True. Uh, Maria Herrera, there is no place for cotton and alfalfa in a state facing increasing water stress amplified by climate change. <laughs> I do want to continue working in the San Joaquin Valley. <laughs> <laughs> so is, is that a, is a polite buy, a pass? Um, we'll let you, uh, we want you to have a job. Um, Kid and Bowles, if Hetch Hetchy Dam were torn down, the water storage capacity could be transferred to a handful of enlarged dams. True. Felicia Marcus, yes or no, you are frustrated with people who think all dams are necessarily bad. True. Uh, also for Felicia, the state badly needs an emergency plan for water for fish. True. Tim Ramirez, you have plants coming out your ears and don't need another damn plan. <laughs> True. <laughs> Uh, also for Tim, yes or no, groundwater will be more regulated in the future. True. Uh, Maria, drinking water safeguards are necessary due to massive amounts of nitrate pollution from ag. True. Yes or no, those safeguards are adequate. Those safeguards are what? Good enough right now. I, no. No. Um, Tim, Yes or no, California stinks at managing crises in real time. 
I would say no. I think we're really good at some crises. I think we could do better in some other examples. Uh, Maria, grade the Brown administration on water management, A through F. <laughs> you are a Brown appointee, so we know this is what you're doing. I would say, I would say an A. I think they've done a lot um, to try to improve water management and be inclusive of disadvantaged communities in that process. Felicia, the Brown administration on water management. <laughs> a for effort. <laughs> B for execution. Cannon Bowles? Yeah, I'd say a B. Tim? I'm going to go with my state-appointed colleagues as well. We don't have to modify any of our answers. And just say that I think um, I felt really lucky to work um, and have been appointed by a governor who knows so much about water. Felicia, the current, yes or no, the current system doesn't work well in high flow and low flow situations. True. Yes, true. True. Either way. Uh, uh, Tim, one good thing about droughts is they're an excuse to shower with a friend. <laughs> In the case of my marriage, I would say yes. <laughs> All right, that's the end. Let's give them a round for getting through. So let's think about, we have a, a no, new governor coming soon. Maria, what would you ask of a new governor coming into the water situation in California, having read this PPIP, PPIC report? What would you? advise a new governor what to do in water in California? You know, one of the recommendations was to find the money. <laughs> and I would say that that is a big task that the next governor has, is to continue to find the money so that we can help these communities address, you know, immediate needs, but also look at how to reduce vulnerabilities. Because, um, you know, this the Brown administration invested a lot of money and found money to help respond to drought impacts. It, you know, prop Passage of Prop 1 brought a lot of money to be able to help communities plan, get the technical assistance they need to develop projects that would that would improve uh, water supplies, water infrastructure. But there's still a lot of communities that are waiting in line for funding to make these necessary improvements, as well as communities that are still very vulnerable to future droughts, relying on a single well, even communities like Sultana and Munson, who were able to get some drought relief, but are still just relying on a, on a, on a one well and are struggling to be able to qualify for money to get a redundant source of water. And I think we really need to look at, you know, not only finding the money, but making sure that the money, um, that the guidelines that we develop for the money work for the, for the most vulnerable communities and that we're getting the money out there qu as quickly as possible. And, and, and also continuing to, uh, you know, as I mentioned before, I think the Brown administration has been really good about um, calling for proper water management and making sure that they reemphasize the need to include disadvantaged communities. And I think that most certainly needs to continue because part of the reason why these communities are facing the challenges that they're facing now is because traditionally they have not been able to be planned part of planning efforts, or they've been purposely neglected. Mm. Haven't had a voice. They haven't been there. Uh, Felicia, uh, Helen, um, Ellen pointed out uh, the volatility facing uh, the climate system. Those temperatures, you know, the wets get wetter, the dries get drier. We have a system that's built for predictability. How would the next governor deal with a system that needs to have, have more elasticity in response to that volatility? Well, I, I think the key for the next governor is is to not be afraid and to pick up the baton and run with it. I think the PPIC report and all of their reports give an incredibly useful um, uh, view of what could be done. I think the water action plan could be dusted off, upgraded, retooled for someone to own it. I think historically uh, governors have come in and only dealt with water in their second term. Uh, Governor Brown came in, but it was his third term, I think. Um, <laughs> and he's not afraid of anything or anybody, I don't think. Um, but I do think that um, it would be a, a tragedy for someone not to come in, make it their own, and run with it. Because you know it's an, an issue on which leadership can make such a huge difference in so many things. I, I, I would agree with Maria. I, I think the drinking water issue is number one 
we've talked about that before, has to be number one, and it's solvable, but it needs somebody bringing people together to find um, solutions, because it's really, we only drink a fraction of the water, actually, even that we use in urban areas. I mean, you know, there's, there's, not, there's a human right to water, not to a giant lawn. Um, but I do think that there's- But we this, eat embedded water. Hmm? We eat embedded water. We eat embedded water. water, which is why I've defended agriculture when people are picking on nuts all the time, although some nuts shouldn't be where they are, to be sure. It's a very, oh, that's a good one. <laughs> Who are you talking about? Um, can I, can I, can Could I say <laughs> true or false now? And just you know, <laughs> sorry, but but I do think there's this enormous, exciting opportunity to really do something great if somebody runs with some of the great ideas that are out there. And I, it is, and I've said this before, a retail politician's dream as well. There are local resilient things. I mean, look at what's happening in. Uh, urban California, like the LA area on stormwater. Folks in uh, urban arenas are coming up with really innovative things to do, and folks in ag are as well. You know, we've got stuff going. We, the legislation hasn't quite passed. We also have a administrative work doing to figure out how to get groundwater in faster in a way that jives with the the uh, our our water rights system for emergency temporary. Permits because you know one person's flood flow is somebody else's recharge. Eventually, people think this is easy to just skim. I mean, there's going to be a war over winter water rights before too long. But it's a great thing for a governor. Ken, I want to ask you uh, the high temperature, the combination of high temperature and uh, low precipitation, drought and high temperature. Tell us what you're seeing in terms of crop shifts, where crops are moving around, and the past. You're already seeing a lot right now. Yeah, it's been really interesting. We are seeing crops move from the southern end of the valley up towards the, the northern end. Uh, we had an opportunity to grow some garlic this year that was always grown in the southern portion, but uh, some of the more proactive companies are looking at their climate history and their yield history and realizing they need, may need to move to other areas. We're seeing uh, some pests showing up that we haven't seen in our area before, which is a huge, uh, huge concern uh, for us uh, because obviously, uh, you know, increased pressure from different pests we're not used to seeing is going to be something that we'll have to deal with. So, so management, you know, we use a ton of data on the farm and, and look at those uh, things very closely. Um, as far as anybody in this room and what we should all be thinking about and any leadership at all, and each of you are leaders in your own way, I would encourage all of you and in the new administration, I'm going off topic just for a second, but uh, to think about the California that we have and think about what an amazing state this is, and lead from that perception of how do we how do we maintain what we have, and how do we increase and grow what we have, and improve what we have? Because I can tell you, as a farmer, I there's there's no part of me that wants fish and the ecosystem to suffer. There's no part of me that wants communities not to have drinking water. Every part of me wants to see the wonders of this state travel up and down it like you all have done. See the incredible things that we're blessed to have. There's no there shouldn't be these black and white outcomes. Those are what we hear about. That's not the, the, those of us who are trying to work towards solutions in the middle are not thinking that way. None of you should be thinking that way. If you're passionate about the environment, that's wonderful, but I don't think anybody doesn't think there should be great local agriculture. I don't, you know, I just don't believe this rhetoric. Don't believe it. Lead from passion lead from this is a California that we want to fight for together because we've got to get these other voices that are trying to drag us apart. Uh, you know, I, uh, people making fun of uh, extinction of endangered species in our area or, or people up here just saying that it's big corporate ag and that's all that it is. We've got to push past all that stuff and we have got to work in the middle and we, we can solve these problems. We've got some of the greatest minds in, in this state and we've got to get over the stuff that's going on because it's, it's, it's holding us all back from a much better future and we owe it to the next generations to have better discussions, more realistic discussions, less rhetoric, and, and a lot more engagement with each other because we can solve any problem that we all come together and put our minds to. We're going to... True. We're going to include your questions here in just a minute, but before we do, we're going to have include your audience questions. Uh, but first, Tim, you talk about silos, about you know the flood people not talking to, et cetera. Um, I want to bring in fire, which has come into a lot of our consciousness very directly recently because the, the, the West is on, on fire. And I've, you know, I've interviewed Schwarzenegger five times when he was governor. He always talked about year-round fire cycle, but it's really come home, certainly in the Bay Area recently. So tell us about how fire, obviously very important for watersheds, and you know, increasing visibility, thinking about fire, and getting that into the water conversation. Wow, that's a big question. Um, I'm tempted more to answer for my day job than my, my flood board position. Um, 
I would say it's a gigantic shift and change. Um, and in some ways, I think Californians have become accustomed to fires and we're used to having fires. I think the scale and the frequency and the shift in timing is what's different about it. Um, and I don't know that we know all the implications of it yet, especially for water. Um, folks used to grow forests in the hopes that it would collect more water. Um, I think there was a lot of question about whether that was actually gonna happen or not, but right now we're gonna probably lose a lot of our forest. Most of it's dead already. We've lost so many trees for various reasons, not just drought, plant pathogens. It's a really big problem, um, and I think it's so big it's hard to get your arms around or even your mind around it. Um, and we think about it, I think about it constantly. I think about it from the perspective also of the flood board role. Um, the upper watersheds are critical, and maybe one point to make in terms of the silos and bring in fire a little bit is the relationship that we have with the federal government. Um, you don't see anybody here on the panel from the federal government. Maybe that's not an accident, I don't know. When I started working in the, this field, a lot of my, my friends and colleagues are in the audience, and most of them, a lot of them work for the federal government when I worked for the state. And the federal government was driving the state to be more progressive. And you know, now we're all trying to find ways to talk to people that work for the federal government, let alone you know, collaborate. On the flood board side, um, before all the change in administration even, the federal government was walking away from responsibility for flooding in the Central Valley. It's a federal flood control project. The state's a non-federal sponsor. It's huge, it's the whole Central Valley, but they told us pretty clearly that they didn't want to be involved anymore and they walked away from the liability. It was very quiet, most folks didn't know about it. Most of the levees in the Central Valley now are out of compliance. They're not part of the system anymore. We bought some time with a very innovative, creative, a uh, plan that most of our local folks develop to um, keep some of the systems in the program in case there is a flood so we can be eligible for federal assistance for recovery. But in the grand scheme of things, we can't maintain the system that we have, let alone plan for a future. Um, and the burden really is on the state, I think, in a lot of ways to think about how we're gonna live in that new future and what we're gonna do from a resource perspective. We inherited the system that was by and large built and run for a very long time by the federal government. And I think increasingly we're seeing less and less of an interest in having their participation. And I think it's gonna put the onus on the state to really think hard about priorities and resources and how we're gonna take responsibility. I think in the end, if you take responsibility, there's more ownership. Um, you could say that at, for the state, also at the local level. And I think that's not a bad thing. I think there's a lot of work to be done, but I agree with the statement about the people that are here and the people that are working in the field, there's a lot of really great, smart people. And I think we need to continue to try our best to, to pull together. Maybe if Jerry Brown offered Donald Trump to buy the, the water system, they might do a deal, right? I mean, you know, let's, uh, um, we're gonna have our questions. <laughs> uh, yeah. Go right here, sure. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Wait, can I stand? I want to stand. Can I hold it? Um, okay. Um, so talking about uh, treating the water system more like the energy grid in a way or treating, treating it more like a grid. Um, with electricity, I think the private sector has had a, a big role to play in promoting more renewable energy and kind of shifting to more, um, more distributed systems in thinking about um, funding our water system and improvements, what type of role does the private industry have in here, whether that's straight up providing funding, whether that's creating their own on-site treatment and, and reuse systems, or partnering around restoration, and my personal favorite I'll just throw in here, beaver reintroduction to provide dams to catch excess flows, reconnect floodplains, and provide habitats. Who'd like to feel that one? Getting private capital energies, generally about 10 years ahead of water, getting the private sector engaged. Cannon? Let's start. I can start this one. Sector, so you can start. Private sector. <laughs> <laughs> you have more I, credibility. I, I, think that, I think there's opportunities for sure for, for private sector collaboration. I, I think it's, you know, we just like we talked about the merging of the CVP and the state. I mean, it, there's some of this stuff that's so entrenched it would be really hard to insert some private parties, but I think 
the private sector can do a lot of interesting, innovative, uh, con conceptual things. You know, uh, projects that could uh, cool water that's coming out of Shasta with, you know, we have this uh, renewable energy uh, that's coming in and actually we go negative in pricing sometimes. So could you do, you can conceptualize some amazing things that you could potentially do with, you know, this new energy grid that we're building and kind of how to, how to weave a lot of things together. But I don't know how much the private sector can get into the middle of, of actual water systems and how much even that we want of that in some ways, uh, you know, privatization of some of that. But again, they, they may be able to do a better job in some, in some senses, but uh, I'd be interested to hear what Felicia thinks. I think part of the challenge is we just, it, the energy system and the water system are really quite different in terms of that. There, there are opportunities. I mean, you have some of the best water agency in the state who are able to move on a dime or in the in the private sector and a bunch of them are sitting in the room I'm not just saying it because they're in the room but um, and, and they're regulated by the CPUC I'm looking at Martha over there and I think um, that's part of what happened where the the opportunity for the private sector and energy came after regulatory um, regulatory uh, efforts and le legislative efforts from 30 and 40 years ago that created the opportunity to invest and decouple rates and all that sort of thing, which um, when you're a, 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 a public water system or a small, that it's like, it's like reverse. So it's 17% or 18% are private in the water industry. The 80 something percent are public and there are thousands of them. So it's just a much more fragmented system. That said, I think there are opportunities in efficiencies, in things like dealing with leaks. I mean, we're doing all kinds of things since the drought. There's all the, all the stuff related to groundwater management where people need information and tools and remote sensing and accounting mechanism. I mean, there's just a lot of stuff there. There's also, as we go to groundwater recharge, and we, we finally, Yahoo, as of 2016, actually have measurement requirements for all California water diverters. Took till 2016 to have that. But you, there are all kinds of opportunities in the technology for folks. The, the, uh, we'll be putting out leak um, law standards in the next couple of years. And there's in, an explosion of innovation in figuring out how to sense where your next leak's going to be or what's the next meter to, I mean, getting precision water is, I think, going to become more and more important, particularly as we see these wild swings. In the institutional part, my guess is that you'll start seeing more and more consolidations as it becomes more challenging. And there may be some opportunities there, but there are all kinds of cultural norms about water and local control that sometimes get in our way and other times are our greatest strength at a local level. So I don't see a massive opportunity other than in the growth of those entities that exist or others like them in certain communities that um, can't handle it themselves. But I think some of the communities that can't handle it themselves, the smaller ones, are going to need consolidation and our help because they, they can't even afford to operate systems. But there are opportunities out there. They tend to be kind of, I think, information wonky, um, information management, remote sensing. But there's, we're going to need a lot of it. Let's go to our next question right there. Uh, my question is for Felicia. Do you know how much the state spends on groundwater treatment per year? And if we were able to save money on groundwater treatment, could those monies be redirected to building a better infrastructure for Canon? That's such a cool question. I don't know the answer to that. We don't spend enough on it right now because people are drinking crappy water. I mean, one of the things that was amazing about the drought is it shined a light on all these people who were running out of water when we had had reports out and other things for years talking about how many people were drinking contaminated water and it was like the tree falling in the forest that, well, more people had heard it than before, again, because of many of the people in this room, but the drought shined this media spotlight on the problem of people who didn't have it as opposed to the people who are drinking lousy water. So we don't we, we probably spend a lot on groundwater treatment, but it's, again, it's done in that fragmented way, so it's not like you can move the, the money somewhere else. I mean, actually, it is incredible that California does as well as it does with such a fragmented system, and I think that's a testament to the people at the local level who've been spending money and doing things in some places. But as far as a system, we don't, we, we really, have a lot of um, spit bailing wire and, and band-aids. We've made tremendous, we probably made 
more progress in the last few years than the last few decades. But again, that's like being the smartest bear in the zoo. We got a long way to go. It's not, uh, I want to ask Maria to, to comment on that. Maria to comment on that. Whether that that focus we have short attention spans these days. Whether that elevated focus on that water access is, has that faded, or do you think that that's still present and that you're still able to, to leverage that? It's certainly still present. Um, you know, most of us talk about the drought being over, but the truth is that there's still many families in the San Joaquin Valley that are still dealing with the impacts of the drought. Our organization continues to manage, you know, tank program, the interim household tank programs. There's still hundreds of families relying on trucked water, waiting for the permanent solution to come, you know, waiting for funding to drill a new well, or waiting for the connection to a neighboring water system. So the drought's not over in the San Joaquin, at least not the impacts of the drought. That's certainly not over in the San Joaquin Valley. And because the impacts were so severe in our area, it's, it's created an awareness and a desire to engage in planning that we haven't seen before. You know, it's much easier for me to go to a community and explain Sigma when they just, you know, got out of this very historic drought. It's very easy for me to say, you know, Sigma is the vehicle for that you need to get on, get, get on so that you can make sure that when we're developing water budgets, the groundwater sustainability agencies know how you're using water and know how you're, and are accounting for your needs as they're projecting water budgets. And certainly, you know, um, from those of us that are working in the San Joaquin Valley on this issue, we're not gonna go away. We're gonna continue to organize communities, educate communities, and continue to attend these meetings, even though some of them are very political, um, because we want to get to a place where we can work together and, you know, recognize, because we recognize that um, we have to develop solutions together. We have to, that's the only way it's gonna work because ultimately um, we need to have healthy communities that have access to safe drinking water and also good economic opportunities and good jobs. We have to have both. It's not one or the other, and we have to have a healthy environment. Next question, welcome. Thank you. Uh, I'd rather hold it, if that's okay. <laughs> um, you're all aware that there is uh, Proposition 3 on the ballot coming up, and I'm getting a little confused on how to vote on that, uh, particularly when the San Francisco Chronicle came out with an editorial uh, pretty strongly suggesting a no vote. So I would like each of the panelists to tell me how I should vote. <laughs> yeah, what, yeah, whatever I say, I can't, I obviously don't represent San Francisco um, or the state for that matter. Um, I would say talk to people that are here and ask a lot of questions. Um, there are a lot of good ideas and a lot of them need funding. Um, this is one way to do that. Um, but, you know, personally, I think a lot of the burden needs to be shared. So. Uh, I would say that it's, uh, it's a very positive uh, development and I think that it's uh, something that uh, can help uh, but has money in it for environmental uh, reasons why it has a lot of endorsements from a number of the environmental groups that are uh, out there you can see a lot of that on on the website there it also has uh, a lot of uh, fixes uh, for some of the issues in the in the Central Valley not just some infrastructure pieces that are there which I feel are important but there's also uh, money there for some of the Sigma issues that we've talked about uh, and there also is money for uh, for a cleanup of some of the drinking water for some of the disadvantaged communities communities. Um, as Maria's said very eloquently, you know, we have issues of, of funding. Um, I actually am uh, more optimistic about solving some of the water pieces. Uh, I think irrigation districts now more than ever are realizing that we have to do a better job uh, supporting our communities and, and we can get surface water. The magnitude of the amount of surface water is, is not it's not as great, it's more the funding for the treatment, and so that's, but it's not insurmountable. Um, but again, we need to be uh, cognizant of the fact that bonds are ways to fund some of these activities, and, and they do have a track record of passing, and so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's worthwhile for a number of different reasons. I'm not allowed to have an opinion on um, something like this until the governor tells me what my opinion is, so I really, I really can't say here, but I'll talk to you later. <laughs> I, th I think there. I think there are always pros and cons. You know, I'm a big infrastructure geek, and I think you should pay for things over time that make sense to pay for over time. I, I think, 
I'd like to support a bond that PPIC put together. Um, but I always want the stuff. If there's a lot of good stuff in there, I, I want it. But I, this has been the most interesting. I can see why you're confused, because I know people who've made very good arguments pro and con, and there are people who've said, you know, let's wait and do a, a, another one. And it's, it's just, it's hard to say, so. Maria. That's an easy question for me because my organization actually endorsed, is, is, is uh, supportive of Proposition 3 and has gone on as someone that's endorsed it, um, primarily because, as I mentioned earlier, we focus on helping communities access funding to make the necessary improvement to their systems. And we know there's you know a, a good amount of money in Proposition 3 to help with water projects as well as wastewater projects. And then as was mentioned, there's 675 million in there to help with Sigma compliance, which is another vehicle to help communities. And within that chapter, $10 million is specifically set to go to the state board to ensure that communities can participate in Sigma and have the technical assistance that they need to engage in this effort, which we see as, as a necessary tool so that communities are not left out of planning. Um, and so we, and, and also by having this, this funding available at the state level, it makes our job on the ground easier when we're trying to, you know, uh, get people to come together and develop joint projects. Um, it's easy when we have the money and we can say, we, you know, there's this pot of money we can go after. But I would also say in addition to Prop 3, we really do need to establish a sustainable funding source for safe and affordable drinking water, which is something that, you know, many advocates and different leaders tried to do this year and we weren't able to do that. But I think, you know, going back to your earlier question of what can the next governor do, that is a very, you know, kind of, low-hanging fruit that they could work on is really make, taking that next step and establishing a you know, permanent, safe, and affordable drinking water fund that can be funded by you know, the public as well as the, the, the private industry um, and make sure that we have an ongoing funding source to help these communities, not just with infrastructure projects, but also with sort of the, one of the biggest funding challenges, is, which is you know, funding operation and maintenance. I think we can take, uh, we're good, yep, the flow is outside, the flow, uh, there's more flow outside for, uh, let's, give the, let's give them a, 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 yeah, a round of applause and then Jeff's going to come up and, um, yeah, of course we have Jeff. So uh, I'm going to finish up and I am told to be extremely brief, which those who know me, that's hard to do. <laughs> uh, Greg and panelists, thank you very much. This is great. Uh, in, the, in, this, in this report, we basically were trying to get at this, these four things, and we kept it to four so I didn't have to use my thumb uh, when, when we did it. When we, when we were looking at plan, planning ahead, upgrade what's, fix what's broken and upgrade what needs to be up, upgraded, come up with allocation, better allocation rules, and find the money and you did a beautiful job of covering all of them. So there really is no wrap up on my part. I need to explain to you why we did, we focused on drought. And Ellen put up a slide that said, because we got argument and the 30 people who were on this, we got a big argument, why are we going on drought? Why are we doing describe the universe, give three examples kinds of report instead? It's drought reveals our weaknesses in the water supply system better than anything else. With deference to Tim, when the next big flood comes along, uh, the flood memory half-life is very short and it's hard to get government to work on it, whereas droughts last a long time. And this is what you guys revealed in this. We don't forget droughts. We remember them, and we change because of it. So that's why we focused on that in particular. So I also want to take, take, take this. So again, thank you to the panelists in particular. Uh, I, I do want to point out that we, we have lots of supporters here in the room who have given us tremendous financial, technical, spiritual menu support as well, all of those things. Uh, and it, it's, it, it's ex especially important. So thank you to those of you who, who supported this or support PPIC. For those of you, and, I, and there's a number of fa faces and names I don't recognize who are new here, welcome to us. If you do not know about us, please go onto our website. And of course, we encourage you to help support this kind of work uh, in the future. So please come, come join us, be part, part of our family. family. Uh, and to each and everyone else, thank you very much for, for joining us today. Uh, I also, I, I, I want to, Greg's right. There's actually, uh, uh, there's water outside in various forms, uh, partially a central nervous system depressant uh, that form. So we hope you will join us. But I also want to point out that there's these fantastic, if you haven't seen them, photographs that are on the wall here of the Salton Sea, 
which did not come up once in our conversation tonight, which is very interesting. I expected that to happen. Um, and this by Lisa Ludos, who's a terrific photographer who has, who has generously donated this for uh, this exposition of, of this work. So I encourage you to go out and look at it. Uh, and again, thank you to all of you. Please join us outside. You have members of the team, the 30 some odd authors. A bunch of us are here. We're happy to answer questions. And you have the PPIC fo folks who are happy to talk to you about PPIC and its water policy. Center. So to the panelists and to all of you, thank you very much for coming.